Good evening and welcome to tonight, Monday, March 20th, 2023, City Council meeting. I would wait a motion to leave the non-public and to seal the minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, next up, um, our regular agenda. Um, Kelly, uh, when you can, will you please call the roll? Mayor McEachern? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Councilor Lombardi? Here. Councilor Blaylock? Here. Councilor Cook? Here. Uh, tonight's, uh, for tonight's invocation, uh, I'm reminded uh, today marks the 20th anniversary of the evasion uh, of Iraq. Um, and in honor of that, um, and to all that have served, uh, not come home uh, from that, and come home uh, to face a, uh, an equally difficult time, I would like to ask a veteran of that war and a person that uh, has committed his life to making sure uh, the causes of veterans are, are taken uh, up and brought into this chamber on a regular basis, uh, Councillor Denton to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councillor Denton. Today, uh, we celebrate uh, Youth Art Month. And I have a proclamation. Whereas Youth Art Month, created in 1961, recognizes that the arts contribute powerful educational benefits to all elementary, middle, and secondary school students by helping them develop critical thinking and problem-solving skills and encouraging their creativity, perseverance, and discipline. And whereas education in the arts provides access to a universal cross-cultural language that we can communicate, express feelings and ideas, make connections, and develop the empathy to pursue personal growth inside and outside the classroom. And whereas the arts provide deep learning experiences in areas we recognize as critical yeah. for success in the 21st century workforce, and as members of our society, problem solving, collaboration, communication, initiative, innovation, and leadership. And whereas the National, Foundation, Edu National Art Education Foundation, in conjunction with the New Hampshire Department of Education, believes art education can improve the well being of our communities by enhancing our sensory perceptions and celebrating the cultural strength of Portsmouth and the United States as a whole. And whereas the leaders of government, schools, and communities recognize art education as a valuable factor in the total curriculum that develops citizens of a global society and generates a better quality of life for all, and whereas there is even greater need now than ever before to help youth harness the proven therapeutic benefits of art making and creative art learning to build social and emotional wellness and to provide additional opportunities for individuals of all ages to participate in art by increasing community, business, and government, governmental support for art education. Now, therefore, I, Dagan McEachern, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council and citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2023 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, as Youth Art Month, and urge all citizens, especially in our 400th year, to celebrate the contributions of art educators and their students to the rich heritage of Portsmouth's past, present, and future given with my hand in the seal of the city of Portsmouth on this 20th day of March, 2023. And I believe we have an educator and Annette here, an art educator. I just wanted to say a couple things um, on behalf of the, the visual arts department in, in um, Portsmouth Public Schools, but also 
the community at large. Um, we it is Youth Art Month, and we're very excited. We are we our show our K through 12 um, exhibit annual exhibit is up and open at the public library. Um, that's called Splash. Uh, and we also have another event coming up this year, which is new um, at 3S Art Space. Our um, high school um, artists will have an arts night on May 19th. Uh, so we're excited for that new addition. And we also had 20 students win 38 awards this year in the statewide scholastic um, arts competition. So we're very, we're very excited for all of them um, and their future artistic pursuits. And I really, really appreciate the city of Portsmouth support um, for a, a thriving art department. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Anna. And uh, some of those uh, award-winning uh, pieces can be found on the fourth floor of City Hall, um, right? It's on the school department side, technically, but uh, it's really impressive stuff. And uh, thank you uh, for bringing this back after uh, a couple of years uh, or COVID where uh, we didn't uh, have the opportunity to read the, the proclamation. So thank you, Ann and Councilor Cook, for uh, making this proclamation happen tonight. Next up, uh, the acceptance of minutes. I'd wait a motion uh, to accept uh, the March 11th, 2023 Special City Council meeting minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next is the uh, recognitions and volunteer committee reports. We have Portsmouth Energy Advisory Committee, uh, Kevin Schrett and Peter Somsich with a few words. Good evening. Again, my name is Kevin Shred. I'm a member of the Portsmouth Energy Advisory Committee and also Portsmouth's member representative to the uh, Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire's board. And I appreciate the opportunity to just say a few remarks. Um, with all of your support over the past many months, we've made really great progress, I think, among the, the Portsmouth Energy Advisory Committee. Um, we've had a steady drumbeat of outreach to the residents within Portsmouth, both from an education standpoint and an engagement uh, perspective. And uh, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time putting together our energy ag aggregation plan, which back just last month on the 21st, the council approved, and it is now with the uh, Public Utility Commission for approval. Um, and I'll say a, a little bit more about that just in, in one second. The uh, Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire has also made uh, great strides over the past uh, many, many months. Uh, just about a year ago, Portsmouth was the 19th member to join the coalition. Now we're up to 30 members, and we seem to be adding a couple more cities and towns every month. There's many more in the kind of in the waiting room right now to join the coalition, but we're up to 30 uh, at this point in time. And we hit a, a real major milestone just a couple weeks ago um, when the coalition has gone out to procure energy supply for our first 10 communities. Uh, this is a really a, all the hard work uh, that has taken place uh, with the coalition and its members to get to this point where we're actually going out to the market and purchasing supply was exciting for the coalition and its members. And we have 10 communities that are going to be going live here shortly. Um, just uh, a week ago in Nashua, we had a press conference where we announced the rates for the coalition, for the go-live, for the initial 10, 10 communities, and it was quite encouraging. Um, the default rate for these communities is going to be 15.8 cents per kilowatt hour, and that compares to the Eversource rate in our territory here in Portsmouth of 20.2 cents. So it's a 22 cent, 22 percent reduction uh, for the default rate compared to uh, Eversource. And if you're a community that's in other utility territories, if you're in Liberty or Unitil, it was even greater. Um, 20.2 Eversource rate is quite high, but just next door in Exeter, they're in a Unitil service territory, it's almost 26 cents per kilowatt hour. So the 15.8 the cents is quite a reduction off of what the utilities are offering at this point in time. The coalition has also offered a package of three other green rates for go live. Um, the default rate is 23% uh, as a 23% renewable content. Um, the other three rates that are being offered by the coalition are going to be 33% renewable, 50%, and 100%. And at the present time, all of those have a rate that's below 
the Eversource rate of 20.2. For example, the 33% renewable content is 16.2 cents, and the 50% renewable is 16.9 cents for Go Live, still substantially below the Eversource rate, which is a much lower, um, much lower renewable content. Uh, these rates are going to be effective through July. So we are tied to the utility rate making schedule. And in the state, it goes from February through July and then August through January. So rates will reset for the coalition and for the member communities again August 1st, with the expectation that the coalition rates will continue to be below the rates offered by the incumbent um, local, local utilities. Um, kind of a, a key fun fact, if you will, just in the first three months of going live, the 10 communities are going to save about $6 million for their, for their member and their residents, and they're going to be able to put aside $8 million in financial reserves. So it's, uh, I think, an encouraging first step for the coalition. Um, back to Portsmouth. All right, we mentioned our energy aggregation plan right now is before the commission. If we stay on schedule, um, they have 60 days to approve that, so it would bring us out to uh, April 11th. At that point in time, we would be able to green light procurement for the city of Portsmouth, and that assumes there's no major disruption to the energy markets between now and then, and our experts don't forecast that to be the case. Uh, so we would, uh, if authorized, be able to move forward with procurement for Portsmouth um, around April 12th or 13th. That would set a clock in motion where we would then notify the Public Utility Commission and the utility, in our case, Eversource, 45 days in advance that we intend as a city to launch a community power program. And then about 30 days prior to go live, there would be an educational mailer that would be sent to all the residents in uh, electric uh, customers in Portsmouth that is chock full of a lot of good information, but it also gives them some quite simple ways to opt out of community power online and by a phone call if for some reason a resident did not want to participate in community power. The, it's, it's quite easy to, uh, to, to not do that. Um, and then 15 days prior to go live, we would have a public informational meeting, and these are all required by, by regulation. And then if we stayed on that schedule, Portsmouth Community Power would launch uh, in the last few days of May, say by June 1st at the latest, and we would be up and running, and we'd be on the rates that I just described. Okay, so even though we're not part of the initial wave of 10 communities, we would be on the same rate through July, and then the rates for all of the uh, members, member cities and towns would reset come, come August, August 1st. There would be additional communication to residents during that whole time frame working with the coalition. Um, they have put together a communication plan for the initial 10 communities that we would leverage. There's going to be, a, I think, a very effective website called Portsmouth Community Power if we were to move forward. Again, that's chock full of, of very good, good information. Um, also on your agenda tonight is approval of some very important governance documents, kind of the guardrails, if you will, for the coalition. A lot of work has gone into the development of those agreements. They've been approved by the Board of Directors at the Coalition, um, and they've been approved by the member communities, the 10 member communities that are about to go live. So the governing bodies of those towns and cities, including cities like Nashua, have approved those documents um, for, for go live. And among the documents, one that's particularly important, and they're all important, but is the cost sharing agreement that describes in great detail how the cost, supply cost, operating cost, general overhead would be uh, accounted for and, and um, flowed back to the member communities and, the, the, you know, through reporting and auditing. It's a very, very important document. And also within that document are provisions that would authorize the, the, um, the Community Power Coalition of, of New Hampshire to procure power on, uh, for Portsmouth. So that's the document that would authorize procurement to move forward if, um, again, the market is supportive come around April 11th or, or 12th. Um, and then just to wrap up, I, I really do think, and our, our committee thinks that, uh, honestly believes that community power and specifically CPCNH is a real important development for the energy market here in, in New Hampshire. Um, it brings a lot of benefit, not only the opportunity for lower rates at a minimum competitive rates, uh, some green, green rate options, 
the ability to build up financial reserves. Um, those reserves are, are used for a variety of reasons, to keep rates stable, for the operational stability of the coalition, and a, as well as the exciting part downstream to invest in local renewable projects. And it also gives us a voice here in Portsmouth, a greater voice in uh, energy policy here in the state through the coalition. So I think the, the, the benefits are substantial. And at the end of the day, a resident in any community, including here in Portsmouth, can opt out at any point in time and can opt back in. Um, so that's a, a nice aspect of, of the program. So again, we thank you. I appreciate your support. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Peter Somsich. I'm also a member of the Portsmouth Energy Advisory Committee. And uh, Mr. Mayor and City Councilors and City Manager, um, HB 315, was, which was the original bill to enact community power as an option for municipalities, was a bill that I heard about the first time as a member of the House Science, Technology, and Energy Committee. The original bill was very hostile to municipalities with utilities still controlling all these critical options. Fortunately, a strong public backlash resulted in a work session with statewide advocates, including former State Senator Cliff Below, who all sat at the table to amend that bill and make it a very good bill. The result was the current community power bill, which is in fact in, in, as law right now, which empowered municipalities of all stripes to act on the climate change front, including steps to increase renewable energy generation and usage, as well as to decrease energy demand using energy efficiency devices. However, no public entity is forced to act, but is empowered only to do so, even if our state still continues to lag behind efforts of our neighboring states or even if our state continues denying obvious worldwide facts. Uh, that Portsmouth has joined the uh, Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire is a very positive step both for controlling the energy prices of our residents and to make a positive impact on our environment. Community power will allow Portsmouth residents to more actively choose greener energy sources, as well as new energy demand reduction processes and devices. Few Americans are aware of the fact that in the period between 1975 and 2017, the American economy has reduced its per capita energy use by over 43 percent. How was that done? It was done by utilizing hundreds of more efficient processes and devices, which has now driven down energy demand. Community power also opens up opportunities to benefit from the offshore wind that, is, that will be generated in the Gulf of Maine, which should be scheduled to arrive here in this area in seven to eight years. Portsmouth could benefit both economically and also by utilizing power purchase agreements to contract for clean renewable energy from an almost local source. Future steps for uh, CPCNH could also include contracting for non-fossil fuel-based heating oil and transportation energy. As you can see, Portsmouth Community Power is, the, is only the first step and not the last of a longer positive path into Portsmouth's future, and I thank all of you for supporting it. So thank you very much. I have copies of this comment here. Thank you very much, Honorable Somsich. Your Honor, I'd just like to thank members of the committee for coming out tonight and speaking to what we have. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Kevin Charette, who uh, is our representative to CPCNH and has become the vice chair and is very busy spending many of his days uh, meeting with that group and helping them get off the ground. So it's, it's our voice from Portsmouth in that organization. Thank you very much, Councillor Tabor, and, and thank you both uh, and members of the committee. Looking forward to it and saw that indeed Nashua is already getting 20 percent lower uh, electricity rates, so look forward to joining that sometime shortly. Um, next up, uh, we have uh, CJ Chen, artist of the Portsmouth, New Hampshire 400th, 
um, Legacy Project Sculpture Garden, uh, the Bohango Park. Um, she's been selected to create the first sculpture uh, for the PH, or PNH uh, Legacy Project, uh, and I'd like to turn it over to Councilor Moreau or Councilor Cook to say a few words and, and hopefully convince CJ to come speak. <laughs> I believe we actually have uh, someone in the audience who is going to come up and introduce her. Barbara, would you like to mm -hmm. come up and introduce CJ? I don't want to take her thunder away. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, it's tough to take Barbara's thunder away. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, this is kind of different as you're used to hearing me speak about my day job at Pro Portsmouth, but this evening I am Barbara Massar chairperson of the Sculpture Review Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Legacy Team. Um, at your last meeting, you were able to meet the other half of our team, which was focused on fundraising. And the, the part of the team that I'm involved in, because we separated the two functions, fundraising and review, were kept separate. Um, I wanted to make sure you knew who was a part of that team because they worked many hours to do research, reading, um, reference checking, Zoom meetings, and then finally interviews via Zoom. Um, the review committee consisted of Elizabeth Farish. She is the chief curator at Strawberry Bank Museum. Leah Woods, who's an associate professor uh, who specializes in woodworking and sculpture at UNH and also a former member of the New Hampshire State Council for the Arts. Lenny Mullaney, who many of you know here in Portsmouth as a local artist, and uh, you probably might even know her through her studio at the Button Factory. Um, someone by the name of Nancy Carmer, um, <laughs> who uh, recently retired from the city of Portsmouth and who was so integral to our process because she has such a wealth of knowledge about how to do things and follow the proper procedures for selecting public art. And last but not least, Tom Watson, who's a retired attorney who's very involved in many philanthropic causes and nonprofits, and it was just an amazing team that was put together for this. Um, so we went through all of last year, ended up in January selecting our sculpture artist, and it was just fantastic to meet her today and her uh, studio manager as well. And so I give you Sija Chen. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to be here after a month of preparation. We're finally here to kick off the community engagement process of um, Endeavor. So I'm CJ Chen. I am a Los Angeles-based multimedia artist. I do apparently sculpture, painting, um, installation, and public art. So my work is driven by uh, driven by community engagement process, especially in public art. My goal is to create site-specific, timeless piece that represent and respond to the local communities. You can see my work in public places like Victoria and Albert Museum in London, in uh, Seattle, uh, Seattle Airport, in uh, North Kansas City, places like that. So I was actually born and raised in Shantou, a small coastal city in southeast China. And I was telling everyone today that when I was doing my research for this project, I was really amazed by how many qualities the two cities, Shantou and Portsmouth, share, especially the maritime culture, which is what inspired me to create my work endeavor. So in this piece, I envisioned two cells dancing together in the wind in a delicate and balanced manner. And on each cell, I incorporate paper cut to present content related to the, port, uh, to, related to the uh, maritime culture of Portsmouth. And those content will be developed through our community <coughs> engagement process. So in this week, while I'm here, I will host talks and workshops and meet with people and I will ask them a series of questions related to Portsmouth. And then their responses will then be visually translated into the, my paper cut final design. 
and also people will have a chance to create their own paper cut and then potentially be included in the final cutout designs as well. And after this week, in, uh, we, I will also host webinars and online workshops so people who didn't get a chance to do it in, uh, to meet with me in person, <coughs> excuse me, will have a chance to do it online to explore the concepts and the art of paper cut. So uh, in partnership with PNH 400, which is amazing, uh, very amazing organization, we develop a website called www. EndeavorForPortsmouth.com. People can submit their responses, images, and paper cut designs through the website. Uh, and this site will be on, uh, this process will be for a month. And after everything, after the sculpture is installed, the site will then be transferred to the people of Portsmouth as part of the legacy of this project. So in short, Endeavor is not just my artistic creation. It's really a collaboration between me and the people of, in, uh, of Portsmouth. This, and then I think this, the culmination of this process will truly be the legacy of this project and be our collective contribution to the creative arts. And I'm very grateful to be here. I'm very excited. And thank you all for having me here today. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sija, and look forward to uh, learn how to do some paper cutting. That's exciting. Um, and I also learned that uh, they're going to be involved with the schools as well. Um, so look forward to seeing what my six-year-old comes up with. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I wanted to make sure that the public is aware that there is a public um, option to participate tomorrow night at the public library in the Levinson Room at 6.30 p.m. So if you're interested in coming and hearing more about the project, um, please come to the public library tomorrow night. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Now on to public comment. Um, if you're on Zoom, could you please raise your hand? Um, first up is Roy Helsel um, with City on Impasse on many items. <clears throat> Good evening, Roy Halsell, 777 Middle Road, Unit 22. I write that the city is in, on impasse on many items. The McIntyre redevelopment. We are now at the same position that we were when this council was elected, and that many had infringed, infringed that the last council were the blame for the for the blame of the McIntyre development, i.e. the election, Mr. Duffy, and the developer Redgate and Kane of this and this council. Now Mr. Duffy was the only public citizen who was for getting more legal counsel and spend the taxpayers' money and city funds when every other speaker said not to spend any more on this project, even after Redgate came were to get the $2 million from the city. The last council terminated the Redgate Kane agreement that this council rescinded and that termination as soon as they got into office citing legal advice. Now who's at fault? Does all this fall? Fall on. Who's at fault does all this fall on? Ask Ms. I asked Mr. Duffy, who stated that he, he had resources on this project. So Redgate Kane has never been a partner on this project. Why was the binding, binning developer plan rejected when it was closest to, the develop, to a developer came that what the majority of the Portsmouth citizens wanted to be. Open space, green area, and not large buildings at no cost to the city. None of these talks have been made public so far, just that it's being turned back to the federal historic people to give direction. Now decisions are being made on electric power supply, us with 
without any public input except for tonight that was described to us, and the taxpayers have to opt out instead of opting in. I can understand that after I talk to Peter tonight. Why no public discussions and inputs? What about the elderly, the retired, only that live on only on Social Security income? Minimal power, they use minimal power on their low, because of their low income. Will it help them? Do they have any say? Thank you, Roy. Right. Next up, uh, Mark Brighton on the topic of ethics. Last time I spoke, I started with Councilor Cook, and I went through each of you, and uh, you weren't here, Councilor Moreau, but I enumerated your many ethical failings, except for Councilor Lombardi, who seems to manage to keep his nose clean. Now, it isn't that city government or city staff have no ethical constraints, but they are situational at best. I mean, if you sit on a land use board, any land use board, and you vote the way the city staff tells you, you have no problems. But God forbid you sit on a land use board and you don't vote the way they want you to, or if you clap at a public hearing. Uh, it's, you know, the full resources of the uh, city legal staff are brought to bear upon you. Now, if you happen to be uh, chair of an ethics of uh, the audit committee and you want to start bringing the city away from the audit that they've had for 27 straight years then and then there's some bogus uh, accusation of process violations yeah bogus uh, bogus accusations of pro of uh, process violations then I mean it is Katie bar the door uh, so, yeah, it's situational at best. Okay. I've Thank you. Say. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up, um, well, we have Zalita, but I see she's on Zoom, so we're going to go through the rest of the speakers. Um, uh, Francis Cormier on the topic of hate is hate. Salida, we will get to you just as soon as we get through the speakers. Uh, last April, I wrote a, oh, Francis Cormier of Melbourne Street. Thank you, Francis. Um, last April, I wrote an, editor to the le an edit editorial to the Portsmouth Herald in response to a political cartoon that showed a picture of Governor Abbott of Texas dressed up like Adolf Hitler and wearing an armband with a swastika sticker on it. How many magazines, magazine covers, have you seen with pictures of conservative politicians like Trump and Governor Abbott with swastikas stickers plastered on them? And, for example, Hollywood celebrities like Kathy Griffin holding a severed head dripping with blood of Donald Trump. Hate is hate, and what goes around comes around. About a month ago, someone went around Portsmouth plastering swastikas at people that he or she hated. It's the same difference. What's the difference? Hate is hate, whether it comes from the political left or the political right. Thank you, Francis. Next up, Esther Kennedy and the topic of rules. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. So when I looked at your platforms again, you all ran on transparency. Last a week ago Saturday, we came. And we came, some of us came early. 
There is an RSA, folks, to say that if you're going to go in non-public, you have to hold a public meeting first and then vote to go in non-public. You didn't even let the public in the building. It said on the sign, we have the pictures, because we were all perplexed. The public will not be allowed in until 345. That's against the rules. Then we go into the meeting, and this isn't an RSA, but it is your council rules to have public comment. Now, Mr. Bl Councilor Blaylock and Councilor Cook, a year ago November, you had no problem coming in here and we could tell you were agitated, we could tell you were angry, but you have the opportunity to have public comment before our vote was taken. You did not like the way we were gonna go, but you had that opportunity. On Saturday at a council meeting, I did not have an opportunity to give public comment. Now you might not like what we were gonna say, but last I learned, knew we were in a free world and we could at least give an have an opportunity to give public comment. That is appalling. We showed up here at four o'clock. We know that the notice got put up pretty quickly the day before. And we showed up here at four o'clock to listen to you and take in what you had to say. I'm appalled that you didn't follow your own rules and he didn't follow the RSA. You can say whatever you want about our council previous to you, but the one thing we allowed is people like Councillor Cook and Councillor Blaylock to stand up here and be very agitated and angry and upset and tell us what they thought. I was not allowed that, and neither was any one of the other citizens I think the paper said 40, we counted 52, we're allowed that. So I'm hoping moving forward, you can stand transparent and you can stand by the rules and the laws of the land and that you can have meetings that are appropriate and that have public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Next up, Peter Huda on the topic of McIntyre and community power. Good evening, Peter Huda, 280 South Street. At the meeting on March 11th, that was the most transparency we have seen on the McIntyre to date. So from that, I would like to ask some questions since I learned a lot from that meeting. My first question, please identify the members of the referred to McIntyre negotiating team that represent the taxpayers of Portsmouth at the negotiating table. This should not be uh, confidential. They're representing the residents of Portsmouth. I think we have a right to know. Two, in the settlement agreement, the city has agreed to be a contributing partner. That was stated. What is the percent of the cost that you have committed the residents and taxpayers of Portsmouth to fund? Should not be confidential. Should be public information. Three, how are you going to fund or pay for this percentage of costs? From the information that was given to us on Saturday, the city right now um, cannot do revenue bonds because they won't give us any revenue. So I would ask, and this is the second request for this, um, that you suspend the rules and let us, the taxpayers of Portsmouth, know what's going on and know what the status is of your meeting with the GSA on the 27th, 27th, 28th. Next thing I want to talk to you about is the, um, the Portsmouth Community Power. Um, Portsmouth Community Power and the Community Power is, um, has been authorized by RSA 53E. The first sentence in that 
RSA says any municipality or county may aggregate retail electric power for customers within its boundaries who consent to being included in this aggregation plan. So we've heard that our EAP energy aggregation plan has been submitted. The public utilities has 60 days to respond to this. Per the RSA, the aggregation program, until it receives this notification that has been approved, cannot fulfill the requirements of part three and four of the public utility of the, of the um, RSA. So I guess I would ask tonight, Councilor Tabor, why are the member contracts and cost data sharing agreement being brought before the council before the EAP agreement has even been authorized, before you have even sent any mailings out to the retail customers, and before anybody has given any kind of consent with public hearings. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. Next up, Peter Officer on the topic of Sherburn. Good evening, Council. Peter Officer, 627 Colonial Drive. I um, just want to follow up on the promise that uh, you, Mr. Mayor, uh, made at the January 31st Sherburne Neighborhood Meeting, um, where you and other members of council, along with Craig Welch of the PHA, held a meeting at the Sherburne School to discuss their plans, the PHA's plans, to develop and build on one of the last completely dry non-wetland parcels of Portsmouth. At the meeting, Mayor McAkron promised that the questions asked during the meeting would be made available to the public via the city's website. Members of the public who attended that meeting and saw video and audio recording equipment took the mayor on his word under the guise that the recording equipment was from the city. We later found out that that recording equipment came from the PHA and Craig Welch, who plans to use that footage for a documentary that they are producing. Mr. Mayor, there is still nothing on the city website. No answers, no comments, nothing. As a voter of yours, this troubles me deeply. I want to be able to trust you and take you at your word, but as my dad always said, actions speak louder than words. Will you make the request to the PHA to share the video footage of that meeting with the city so the general public who were not able to attend or be there that night can also hear the responses that were given? Secondly, I want to address the Land Use Committee, and specifically the meeting that took place on the 10th, where the Land Use Committee, who had been tasked with providing to Council a report of all the available land in addition to the Sherburne School, that could potentially be used for housing. The report that was discussed at that meeting was, a, was an okay start, but I think more due diligence should be done. I don't think an Excel spreadsheet that simply lists not all, as we found out at the meeting, but some of the available land meets the directive that was given by the council. I was glad to see that the lower parking lot here at City, City Hall that abuts South Street was included on that list, but only after input from the non-council members of the committee spoke up. Why did that lot or the community campus not make the original cut? I don't know, but I'm glad to see that at least the lower lot that again is right here is on that list now. I for one think that would make an almost perfect spot for workforce housing, not only because it's walking distance to town, but it's also close to coast uh, bus stops. It's also, um, also because at the neighborhood meeting that took place at the Sherburne School, Craig Welch, the executive director of the PHA, was asked if he would support a development on South Street, the same neighborhood he lives in, to which he, I quote, said, you're damn right I would. Either way, more research is needed. Certainly more can be done than, to just, simply, than just simply performing a Google map search and calling it a day especially when it was made clear that every option had not been taken into account, which is why I was encouraged by the non-council members of the committee that pushed back and said they would be delivering the first draft, that, that, that said by delivering that first draft to the council would only be a political football or seen as that. I also think that it's important to remember that Portsmouth is already in a pinch for developable, not, uh, developable and open non-wetland areas. I heard at the last council meeting that there's need for rec fields and potentially a hockey rink, and as a parent, I agree that we have a need for more rec areas. As a father of girls, I found it also incredibly sexist 
that the only that you're only willing to develop a girls softball field at the Sherburn school when you're not willing to take into account any of the boys rec fields. I think we should be cautious also about just giving land away to the PHA. Again, a private developer who is already Portsmouth's largest landowner. I think it might be more appropriate to ask them, hey, you guys are Portsmouth's largest landowner. Why don't you think about the properties you already have? So before you guys send a, you know, or try to throw a political football Hail Mary for whatever your agendas might be, why don't you then go back to them and ask, hey, can you guys use what you already have? And can we use the land, the, Peter, the, the, the little amount that we have thank you. for better usage? I appreciate it. I, I hope you appreciate it. Next up, Sue Polidora with a couple of points. Hi, good evening, Sue Polidura, 245 Middle Street. And I just would like to, like I said, a couple of points. Number one, after that meeting that was held on a Saturday, I mean, that was a very unusual meeting. And the following headlines on the Portsmouth Herald regarding the McIntyre project, I see that that discussion is almost at the end of the agenda tonight. And I would like to ask and request that the council will suspend the rules and move that discussion further up, like maybe after the public comments. So we can get this out of the way. People have questions, they'll be able to answer them uh, rather than being so tired at the end of the evening that nobody wants to, uh, is here or want to make a comment. The other comment I want, I would like to make, and I was here for that meeting as well, and I was surprised at some of the, um, some of the comments that I heard uh, our city attorney make because, as you know, I have done purchasing and I have done some contracting in my career, and I cannot fathom why a contract would be signed not allowing the city, uh, we used to call this uh, an escape clause when we did contracts, or some uh, contracts, or some sort of ramp uh, off, just in case that things went awry, and you needed to dissolve a partnership that you have with somebody else. All of the time you have to make sure that when you're working a contract, you have the best interest of your cost, of your boss, of your company in mind when you go into these agreements. It cannot be just whatever is good for the other side. Looking at the agreement, it almost looks to me like someone from Sobel Square was the one that wrote it and that we just agree to whatever, the, whatever they said, rather than carving out an option that will give us an out. All of that needed to be um, uh, put on a caveat or the final approval from the National Park Service. They don't approve it, everything goes away. Both parties just go back to the beginning. That's one of the things that should have been in this agreement. I didn't think it was, I still, would like to know why it wasn't. This is uh, negotiating 101. So I would like to know if that changing the rules and talking about McIntyre after public comments is possible, we would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Next up, Liza Hewitt on the topic of community power. Good evening, Liza Hewitt, 726 Middle Road. It sounds this evening like the signing of this community power uh, contract is a foregone conclusion. However, I worry about the nine of you making a decision to change the electric service of 22,000 people. I know there have been some, there's been some community outreach, but no public hearing in front of the nine of you, no referendum by vote, just the nine of you making this decision. I would like to know legally who from the city has reviewed the community power contract. Your review of contracts recently, such as the McIntyre contract, has not gone well for the residents. Why would we think this contract will be any better? Residents should be allowed to opt in. By all means, opt in. 
But I don't think the nine of you should vote to change 22,000 people's power service and force them <coughs> to opt out. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. <laughs> Next on Zoom, we have Zalita Morgan. On the South Mill Pond and other yeah. topics. Hi, this is Alita uh, Richards F. And um, um, I want to talk briefly about the state of the um, the bad state of uh, South Mill Pond Park Ground uh, in the area that connect around the walkway between Parrot all the way through Rockland. It seems that on a daily basis, some type, type of truck is driving, taking that little little path passage and driving all the way up to the middle of the two courts. And this is, has really destroyed, has created an incredible uh, uh, um, big potholes, uh, uh, the threads of the, the, of the wheels and the tires. It's really deplorable. We, we have a very beautiful park and I don't know if this is a, a city truck and if it's not a city truck that is servicing, uh, because you can service the, the courts by parking at the, 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 the South Mill Pond um, parking spot, right? Parking lot. Um, but if it's not, then maybe we can have our police department look at the, um, the security video from the middle school because it's right there and provide some insight and see how we can stop this from happening so first i think if the city administration can look into it what is going on if anything from the city and if not take an action um and report back to us that would be great um the other um topic that i wanted to ask is I think it's on a matter of uh, residents' communication with the council. I have spoken about this prior, and somehow, somewhere, our communications with councilors are being also sent to uh, emails within the city administration. I have looked back. This was not a practice when I was a city council. It was not approved by us, and I have not found any approval from past city councilors to making a change in that. However, I really think there is a benefit on having the city man, a link on the page to send an email to the city manager. And I also wish you to have a link to send an email to our planning director and to the, the facilities manager, you know? I think that those are valid things, but we should decide who to send it to. It shouldn't be a decision made by somewhere else behind the scenes without approval. Um, so I really would like to ask that you take action as our council to number one, stop that from happening, remove any, any non-city council um, names or addresses from that communication, uh, request that a link is provided on the city website to the city manager and also that your email addresses do not have any forward or you know some other uh, uh programming behind that would land any correspondence sent to you to be automatically sent and driven to other others within the city administration again i think it's just a matter of saying that um nice thought but i think at the end we should be the ones making that decision Thank you so much. Thank you, Zalita. Next up, uh, Honorable Jackie Kelly Pitts. I really don't have much to say. I was just, didn't think I had my hand raised. I was just uh, listening to the community power discussion and I have a lot of questions, but I'll let that lie. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Jackie, have a good night. I All right, really uh, that is it for public comment. I'd wait a motion to move up the city manager's uh, informational item on the McIntyre. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Your Honor. 
Uh, to give an update to the public, we remain at an impasse with our development partner. We continue to communicate with our development partner in an attempt to move beyond the impasse, and we continue to collect and analyze pertinent data generated by our two outside consultants, Cumming and RKG. Uh, to answer a question raised at public comment, the negotiation team consists of myself and City Attorney Morrill and any city staff that seem appropriate. Uh, it's primarily Susan and myself. There has been no commitment of funding for the project amount uh, as it is not defined in the settlement agreement. And there has been no commitment made and will not be made before a public hearing and some type of work session where we can, we can hear from the public. Uh, we, uh, we had a check-in with the General Services Administration on March 13th. We apprised them of the impasse. They thanked us for the information and uh, asked us for a copy of the vote taken, which we provided, and our next check-in with them will be on March 31st. And I believe the city attorney wants to add a couple of points, if, if she may, Mayor. Certainly. Thank you. Um, just to um, clarify a couple of points about um, our impasse, our impasse involves um, the development agreement, which in 2019 was signed by both parties on the previous plan. And in that development agreement, it had termination rights, as you said, um, often called outs or off ramps. That was signed by the developer and the city. When the new project um, after the settlement agreement was signed in April of last year, the new project needed a new development agreement. We had every expectation that those uh, termination rights would be in that development agreement. However, the developer um, has not signed a version of the development agreement with those termination rights in it. And that is why, one of the reasons why we are at an impasse. Any questions from the council? Councilor Dunn. Just for clarification, there hasn't been any agreement signed by the development partner, correct? Correct. Okay. Councilor Boylock? Well, thank you, Your Honor. And is it true that um, we continue to try to negotiate and work in good faith and try to move forward and let's interest the best in the city? That's correct. We still have weekly meetings, and, and that is the posture the city is taking. Any other questions from the council? Thanks, city manager. Uh, next up is the public hearing and vote on ordinances and or resolutions. The first reading of ordinance amending chapter 10, accessory dwelling unit use regulations, accessory dwelling units, site development standards and terms of general applicability. I'd wait a motion to pass first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading at the April 3rd, 2023 city council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Moreau. Um, I'll just speak briefly to it. Uh, we did spend a lot of time at the planning board and made some further changes to um, this. We outlined a little bit more clear about the administrative approval process. We also put in a waiver for the parking requirement. Um, and then there was also some changes as to where things would be administratively approved. So. Hopefully everyone can take a look at it and um, we can have a public hearing and hear what the public says next month. Next month, yeah, that is next month. <laughs> Councilor Bullock and Councilor Bagley. Thank you, um, and I just wanted to thank Councilor Moreau and the whole planning board uh, for their work on this. I did notice a couple changes and I, I agree, um, but yeah, I just want to thank them for their work. Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I echo those thoughts. I, I thought um, some improvements were made at the planning level um, however, I do think that we could make a, a few more adjustments to make this, uh, you know, 80s, ADUs even more possible to build in the city. So I'll bring those forward at the next meeting. And a parliamentary inquiry, uh, we will be able to bring amendments forward at the second reading, as I understand it? Yes. All right. Um, and that will be, um, I'd ask any uh, amendments that are planned uh, for that to be um, in the council packet before uh, the discussion, if possible, to give those in the public uh, the most amount of time to discuss and speak to those uh, amendments. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, did 
Were you going to say something? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Oh. Thank Councilor you. Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, this wasn't in relation to the vote. I was just making sure that that was clear. Um, I was going to ask to suspend the rules and bring forward, um, forward item 15B2 because we have someone on Zoom who's joining us. Um, I don't want her to sit there all night. Um, oh, okay. Um, changes uh, to the ordinance for the cemetery committee. Oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So we have a, this would, uh, I'd wait a sample motion to schedule first reading of the ordinance change at the April 3rd, 2023 city council meeting. And this is changes to the cemetery committee ordinance. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this, Councilor Cook? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I am bringing this forward from uh, the governance committee. Um, we were asked to review um, proposed changes to the cemetery committee ordinance from the cemetery committee chair. Um, and we have her available for us tonight on Zoom to speak to this if there are any questions. We also have the deputy city manager, deputy city attorney, attorney Suzanne Woodland here as well, who serves as the liaison for the cemetery committee. Um, are there any questions on this policy? Council Moreau. I'm just of the assumption that we probably in bringing down the numbers is because we don't have those spots actually filled on cemetery committee. Um, yes, that's actually accurate. That was the presentation we received at the governance committee is that um, they actually at the cemetery committee are having difficulties creating quorum and reaching quorum um, because of the large number of mm -hmm. members and not having enough members to fulfill that. Um, so they've requested that they change the number of members. Um, they've also come to us with a request that we stagger their membership terms because currently the way the ordinance is written, all their, all their terms expire at the end of this council term and would have to be reappointed at the beginning of a new council. So the goal that is to create some stagger. Thank you. And I believe we do have uh, Sue Steri here. Sue, so would you like to say anything? Yes, uh, um, I well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody uh, from the city council and the city departments um, for, you know, creating this committee last, uh, well, almost two years ago. Um, and I have a, or I should say, we are a really dedicated group. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them work and, um, and travel with their work like many of you do. So oftentimes we may have eight people at our meeting. However, we may only have three in person and, and the rest are on Zoom for whatever reasons. So um, I'm hoping that um, decreasing the numbers will be able to get more people there. And that way um, we can you know, have our, our Zoom people included in, in some of our um, voting going forward. Um, we, we care, we just can't seem to get it together, in, you know, in the same place at the same time at this point, as I think a lot of other groups at this time. So it would be very beneficial if we could decrease our numbers so our quorum number could be in person, could, we could reach it more often, so. Well, Sue, so it's certainly clear that you, that you care and thank you for all the hard work. Uh, thanks for, uh, Councilor Cook for bringing this forward. Um, Provided this passes uh, first reading and, uh, and gets a second, I imagine we could go through that pretty quickly. But um, all in favor of uh, moving uh, this to first reading? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Councillor Cook. All right. No city manager action items uh, this evening. Um, Next up is the consent agenda. I'd move to adopt. I'd wait a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, next up, uh, a sample motion. I'd wait a sample motion to uh, accept email correspondence and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, um, 
there is a letter from uh, Courtney Perkins, Prescott Park Arts Festival, requesting an exemption to the City Prescott Park Arts Festival lease agreement to add a special tribute performance outside of the season celebrating seminal musicians in Portsmouth musical history, the Shaw Brothers, on Saturday, uh, Saturday, September 11th, 2023, with a rain date of Saturday, or Sunday, September 12th, 2023. I'd wait. Uh, motion to approve? So, so moved. Second. We have a correction, Your Honor. Yeah, the um, dates are actually September 9th and 10th because the 11th is a Monday. Oh. But I'd also just like to point out um, that that's also the weekend of the air show. So there's going to be a lot going on in the city that weekend. <laughs> I believe there's something else going on at Strawberry Bank as well on that Saturday. So pretty busy summer. It's a pretty busy I hope, weekend. <laughs> I hope the Shaw brothers can incorporate a, a couple of uh, turbo jets uh, uh, over the uh, Piscataqua. Um, but uh, I. Um, would have a friendly amendment to the 9th and 10th of uh, September uh, for the uh, concert date. Yep. And Your Honor, I'll, I'll abstain on this as chair of the Arts Festival Board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? One. All right, next up is a, a letter from Robert uh, McGigan um, of Rolling Thunder requesting uh, establishment of a POW MIA Chair of Honor Program in Portsmouth. I'd wait a motion to the city manager with authority to act. So moved. moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, first, thank you, Honor, for bringing up tonight being the 20th anniversary of the launch of the invasion of Iraq. Um, the one military acronym that still haunts me to this day is DUST-1. Not many people are familiar with it. It stands for uh, Duty Status Whereabouts Unknown. And essentially, it's the equivalent of a soldier, Marine, airman being missing. And uh, when I was in Baghdad, we were all issued personal locator beacons, just given the reality of being advisors to a foreign military. And it was October 26, 2006, where uh, Dust One went out across the radio and we proceeded to lock down the capital city of over five million people and search every trunk of each vehicle trying to exit the city. And it took over five years before it was confirmed that the soldier was killed, that the dust one was for, and the remains were returned to the family. So having a MIA POW chair would mean a lot to many veterans, especially to families of veterans who never who never knew what happened to them. And um, as commander of the VFW, I would gladly work with the city on making one happen. Thank you, Councilor Denton. Any other comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Under my name, uh, appointments to be considered that it will bring forth um, at the next meeting um, this is uh, Ernest Carrier uh, as an appointment uh, as an alternative to the Planning Board, uh, Daniel Main, a reappointment to the Portsmouth Housing Authority, Jackie Kelly Pitts, reappointment to the Rec Board, uh, Richard, Duffy, uh, Richard Duddy and Lauren Kranz, also reappointment to the uh, Rec Board, uh, Jessica Blasco, uh, appointment to the Blue Ribbon Sustainability Committee, John Patrick Carty, appointment to the Blue Ribbon Sustainability Committee, Jeffrey Matsman, uh, appointment as a regular member, as currently an alternate to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, ML Geffert appointment as an alternate to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, and Jody Record appointment as an alternate to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Uh, please, if anybody has any questions uh, or uh, comments on these applications, uh, please uh, reach out to me, and the uh, applications are in the packet and will be brought forth for a vote next week. On to Councilor Tabor. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I would propose a motion that the City Council hereby authorizes the City Manager to enter into the cost sharing agreement and member services contract for the complete service bundle with the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire, CPCNH, with City Manager Conard as the authorized officer, and with elections on page 19 of the agreement being yes and be it further moved that the Portsmouth City Council hereby approve CPCNH's data security and privacy, energy and portfolio risk management, rates and financial reserves policies as presented. And those are- Second. 
all in your packet. Um, I think Kevin Charette gave us a very good summary. Um, it's exciting to me that residents under this plan could buy 100% renewable power for less than they're spending right now for dirty fossil fuel-based power with Eversource. And it could be a game changer in how our residents can vote with their utility bill to make us a more sustainable city. Um, question for the city attorney, have you had a chance to review these documents from the city's uh, liabilities? The legal department reviewed all of these documents and we also consulted with the other communities who have approved these documents and with their legal staff. And um, so we found these to be appropriate. Great. Okay. Um, and I know that there's uh, concerns about the opt-in and opt-out. Um, I think, as Kevin said, we'll give residents numerous ways if they don't want to obtain the savings or buy the greener energy that they could stay with Eversource. And I'd also point out that right now, the utility doesn't ask them whether they want to stay with the utility rates. They're automatically uh, enrolled every six months. So if we become the default, at least a resident can come to us at the city council and through our representative on CPCNH, we can make changes in the program. I don't think anyone who would want to make changes in the program will get very far going to the Eversource building, wherever that is. Um, and <clears throat> quite honestly, I th think we have the opportunity here to do a lot of good for our residents, and the opt-in is very important to making that work. So um, the Energy Committee reviewed, we, we spent a lot of time learning about energy portfolio management, um, and we had very smart people from the industry on that committee. And our conclusion was, this is new, it is a startup, there are risks, but the benefits substantially outweigh the risks. And the risks are low because any resident can exit at any time. It's, it's not like the Hotel California. You can leave any time you want. And the city can exit at any time it wants. And in either case, the utility, once you've signed up for their delivery of power as an account, they have to deliver you power. So um, there are off ramps if there are any problems, and we feel the risks are quite low because of that. And the benefits, frankly, are better than we expected, as we're seeing with all the cities and towns. So I, I did want to address that. Thank you, Councillor Tabor. Councillor Denton. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released yet another report just today which stressed the urgency of action for just a livable planet. And uh, granted, we're not the UN, but what we can control is whether or not residents have this option of uh, clean energy. So it's a small step, but it would be a big step in what residents could do to obtain a uh, livable future. Thank you, Councillor Denton. Councillor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just want to take a moment to, to thank uh, Councillor Tabor uh, for really leading this, as well as Councillor Denton and Cook and former Councillor Leesenby, and of course the whole um, community power group who's done all this extensive work uh, which brings me to my second point because it has been raised a few times that you know maybe it's not right to opt uh, citizens into this um, what I would push back is we're a, we're a city of 22,000 uh, the last election 6,099 people voted for the City Council and I would say a lot of people um, look at the City Council maybe like as a offensive lineman in football the less they hear from us the better things are going they usually don't hear about us when we make a mistake and I think most residents, when they have a chance to save substantial money on their electric bill, want the city council to go forward and make that happen. 
and we're doing that in the best possible way. One of the challenges with the different community or the different power options that you have out there, other than Eversource, is if you're not an expert, they can be confusing, and you don't know which one to sign up for. So we've had a group of volunteers take a really deep dive, a really good look, find out what the best possible power provider is for our community in almost all cases, and that's why we're moving forward um, potentially and having everybody sign up for it because we've looked at all the options extensively and, and this is overwhelmingly what's best for our residents. So it would be a dereliction of duty for us not to um, provide this, uh, these great advantages for our residents. Council Bullock, then Council Cook. Thank you. Um, and I'll um, reiterate Council Bagley's comments. Um, I want to thank everyone on the hard work they've done, um, the Ener Energy Advisory Committee, um, Councilor Tabor. Um, but I think this is a great opportunity to save some of our residents' money, to give them an opportunity to save some money. Um, if some people are upset that we are opting them in and we're going to save them some money, I'm okay with them being mad at me for saving some money and they can opt out whenever they want. Um, and as Kevin Schritt said, they could opt, there's going to be a um, mailer that goes out 30 days before, and then there'll be another um, in-person session 15 days before. So there'll be lots of opportunity um, to inform people and give them a chance to opt out so they hopefully aren't blindsided by this. Thank you, Council Boyer. Council Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just first want to say that it is a great honor of mine to sit on this committee with Councillor Tabor, um, to see all the work that he's put in and to see all the work that this committee has put in to get to this stage. Um, we are very fortunate in the city of Portsmouth to have um, great expertise um, on the committee, uh, to get fantastic advice. And we have been through um, meeting after meeting every month um, for uh, since I started on the council discussing moving to this point um, where we have invited people to come and talk to the committee. These are publicly noticed meetings. Uh, we had two public hearings to discuss this with the public and we brought in members of the public and, and discussed community power. Then we also had a work session of the council. Uh, we had another a session of the council to discuss the energy aggregation plan and now we're at this final stage of uh, council discussion and the final approvals um, for the legal documents to to give uh, the city manager the authority to go ahead and move forward if if um, everything works out on April 11th and that's what uh, Kevin Charette was here to explain to us all tonight um, we still have one final opportunity to opt out if there are any challenges um, for uh, by April 11th, um, but we would then be joining the coalition and we would be joining um, the second half of the first wave um, community. So we have 10 going ahead of, ahead of us first. Um, so I think that's always for, good to remember is that we're not the first ones. There will be a billing cycle ahead of us. There will be a process ahead of us um, and we are joining um, this second part of the first wave cities by agreeing to these um, agreements tonight and then giving the the final yes on April 11th 12th time frame so I hope that you all um, will support this tonight thank you Councillor Cook any other comments any other questions uh, I will be supporting this uh, as well um, I think that there is um, we're moving uh, from one opt-out program to another opt-out program uh, which is reducing the cost by 22 percent at the moment um, and we'll have plenty of advanced uh, warning on uh, what the next rates will be and the worst that can happen is the city could pull the plug and decide on folks you know if this breaks within or the month council Morrow. Uh, <clears throat> um thank you are we st I know and I read so much that it gets confusing after a while but are we we're starting with the basic the uh, granite basic plan so that everyone can then opt up if they want to is that where we're starting that that's uh, where we are right now I think it's worth discussion maybe at the April meeting okay because the rates are so favorable uh, that people could go from 28 to 33 cents or even 50 cents uh, or 50 I'm sorry 33 percent renewable uh, for only a penny more so that's something we could 
uh, maybe our energy committee will give you a recommendation. But as it stands now, we would go with the granite basic. Okay, thank you. And I think there is, um, there was one speaker who stated that how can the nine of us decide uh, for 23,000 people? And um, I'd like to address that because I think it speaks to a lot uh, in Portsmouth. There's, we just had town meeting day, of which we are not a town. Uh, we have a town feel. When I walk around the North Mill Pond, I know a lot of folks. Uh, it feels like a town, but we are a city, and the form of government that we have as a city is a representative democracy where we have nine elected officials that make decisions like this uh, in the financial and fiducial interests of the city of Portsmouth on a fairly regular basis. Um, and it's because there are a lot of decisions that come before us. It's our responsibility to look at them um, and act uh, and not put to a public referendum uh, what we believe is in the best interests of the city. And I believe that this is in the best interest of the city, not only for the dollars and cents, which I love, uh, because I feel like in order for us to change habits, the easiest way is to change prices. Uh, and if we can create an incentive, that's going to change uh, prices and hopefully leads to more investment um, in that space. But it's also um, what this has the potential to be. And I think it is what was intended with the deregulation of the energy industry in New Hampshire at the beginning. Nobody came in. Nobody came in to, to offer any lower rates that were not confused or uh, complicated because the very definition of utility is it's provided. Uh, the government tends to provide these things. It is a utility, and to put it to the open market failed in New Hampshire, and it failed dramatically compared to the rest of our state because of the inaction in Concord. And the fact that we get to right that wrong on the local level and get to save money for taxpayers is a no-brainer for us to support this. And so I will gladly uh, support this and look forward uh, to working with the Energy Advisory Committee in order to make sure that we are delivering the best for Portsmouth. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, uh, Councillor Cook on your, uh, or the city, not your, uh, the city uh, council donation policy. Um, take it away. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, tonight I move to bring forward the draft donation policy passed by the Governance Committee included in your city council packet for action at the city council meeting of April 3rd, 2023. So moved. I mean, second. <laughs> um, and I, I guess I should introduce this by saying um, that the Governance Committee has been working on a donation policy since um, uh, last year in the fall, uh, mostly because of direction and requests here at the council level to look at donations and how we handle donations um, as a city. Um, we didn't have an overarching donation policy, and um, so we had to start with uh, drafting a donation policy and we have been very fortunate that we had a lot of support from uh, the deputy city manager deputy city attorney Suzanne Woodland in working on uh, researching donation policies across um, communities and and comparing those donation policies first then providing input in the governance committee on what we were looking for and then we went back out to all of our departments um, and <clears throat> gathered information from the police department the fire department the library board of trustees and the school department to find out what their policies look like to make sure that we're not creating conflicts internal conflicts and to make sure that we're consistent across the board um, at the city level so um, tonight what i'm asking is for you to to review um, the donations policy that we finally passed at the governance level after several um, reviews and uh, move it f forward for the next meeting um, to take action um, at the next meeting. And the reason I'm doing that tonight rather than just asking you to take action, I think it's important for everyone to see it twice um, because it's quite an extensive policy. In versus just a, on a clarity uh, level, uh, versus an ordinance change, since this is a city council policy, if we were to vote on it tonight, it would become policy. And so by putting it for action at the next council meeting, it sort of gives that first reading, second reading, even though there's not for the public consumption of this. Thank you. Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Um, I would reiterate, uh, we did spend a lot of time on this. Um, and we had went through a number of edits uh, and thank you also to deputy city manager city attorney um, 
the last time, the last few edits were so minor um, because they were basically uh, grammatical sometimes, and, and so it was really reviewed very thoroughly. And um, I think it's ready for the city council to take a look at and um, move on. Thank you, Councilor Lombardi. Any other discussion? Councilor Blaylock. I just have one question, um, and I want to thank all the work that's been done on this. This is awesome. I'm all for um, um, encouraging donations and making it the process as easy as possible um, and understandable as possible. Um, I have a question. This might be for the city attorney, because I've had other um, members of our community ask to donate money, but they really wanted to donate to a 5013C. And I've heard of towns in like Massachusetts having their own 5013C. Um, I didn't know if this was, um, and you know, you can get back to me on this question. Um, <laughs> well, I think Attorney Woodland. Yeah, right yeah, yeah, more for Susan. Might have an um, but no, I've just had that expressed by potential donors. So the city of Portsmouth is not a 5013C. Um, however, we are generally considered tax exempt. So it is a distinction that matters. Uh, under the IRS code, but often not to the individual taxpayer in terms of your contributions to an entity such as the city of Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. But it is a different, Okay. So we're a different animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they would still, I mean, it's their donations, their tax, they can write off their, their donation from their taxes. So uh, one of the things that it, we've talked about um, in-house is coming up with a form letter okay. and what we generally do is try and say you should seek your own tax advice but we are a tax exempt organization a municipality so there's like a different uh, sort of magic language that we fall under um, but we generally always put the and check with your own yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, accountant but we're working on a form letter actually okay. so awesome. that there's consistency across the departments thank you yeah I just want to ensure that the donor that they would feel as comfortable as possible um, yes. and then they would more likely to donate <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. Councilor Murrow um, just to help explain that's a little bit why the Portsmouth New Hampshire 400 formed a 501 c3 yeah. was so those donations could go directly and they could be tax um, deductible for the donors of that oh Councilor Begler yeah thank you honor um, Thank you to the committee for putting this forward. I think it's really good. Um, I do have a question. I don't know the answer to this, but I'll float it out there. I believe donations up to $100 can kind of just be approved by the city manager. And while I think that's probably a reasonable number for now, um, you know, this will probably be in place for, say, the next 10 years, and $100, unfortunately, does not go quite as far as it used to be. So, it, for instance, what I'm thinking of is if a city employee or a board member, if there was, like, a, a conference that they got invited to attend to, and, and the conference fees were like $110. Is, does, would they be able to accept that, or would it have to go through council first to be accepted kind of thing? Or does that kind of tie our hands a little bit for that type of scenario? Well, I would imagine if they went and, they, and it wasn't accepted, they would come out of the, the funds, right, of the, the general funds we'd have to pay for it. Councilor Suzanne. <laughs> it's, Sorry, that's a complicated one. I just thought of it tonight. So I'm not, I, I want to clarify what you've, you've outlined for a scenario, which is you have a third party entity offering a free invite to a particular event. Now, if it's for a business purpose, um, you know, it would depend on whether that would fall under under that but typically you have a section of the uh, chapter one that deals with conflict of interest sort of individual gifts so you know uh, someone offers an employee for example an invitation to a baseball game and the value of that ticket is more than a hundred dollars so you're under article one chapter one I should say of your city ordinances that's a gift to the employee that would have to be rejected, declined. So in that scenario, it's falling under, it's just a, a gift to an individual, and that's governed by 
your ordinance, which is kind of the next task that the governance committee is going to be looking at, which is that conflict of interest. Um, I think if you're talking about some, I'm trying to think, special event that maybe, I don't know, I senior could, staff are, are invited to for a business. Like say there was a, um, you know, like a planning person who who's well known and writes books and there was a conference in Boston or Portland and they said, you know, we'd like the city of Portsmouth to send a designee, but the fee was $125. Like, is that? Uh, well, the, the departments actually budget for some small amount of, you know, depending on the department and the need to go to conferences. Now, certainly if the organization wanted to make a free ticket available, then yeah, it would go through, it would be considered a donation. So if it were more than $100 and, in value, then it would go through this process, mm -hmm. in my view. Great, thank you. Any other discussion? Motion is for action uh, at the next meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, uh, City Manager, you have an another informational item. I do, Your Honor, thank you. Last week, I uh, saw my first full uh, board meeting as a member and a director of the Peace Development Board of Directors. I sit on a total of five ad hoc advisory committees, two of which I've already met, Port Committee and Golf Committee. I also sit on Audit, Transportation Management, and the Legal Bill Review Committee. Um, items of note from the last meeting include the announcement of a recent $7 million FAA grant for the Arrivals Hall project, which is very exciting for the airport side of the PDA. Uh, Director Farini made sure to point out that when the matter of millionaire comes before the PDA for a vote on its conditional use permit request, that uh, all information be available one week prior, so there should not be any walk-on or surprise pieces of information. That's that was of interest. Um, on the aeronautic front, the, the commercial side of the airport met the FAA obligation of achieving at least 10,000 passengers implaning, I did not know that was a phrase, outpacing chartered implanements in just two months of operation. So that speaks well of Allegiant and, and the work they're doing in garnering uh, the market here. And as far as golf goes, demand is through the roof. There are 60 events planned for this year with over 5,000 tournament rounds. I think that means something to people who golf. It means less to me, but I'm learning. <laughs> and uh, at the Grill 28, they, they made a significant investment in a golf simulator, which in the month of February yielded $18,000 in regional um, regular food and beverage uh, revenues and $23,000 in function sales in February. So those are of note, and I'll keep the, the fun facts coming, and our next meeting will be in April. Thank you. And the next meeting will be after our April 3rd. City Council meeting? Correct. So I'll provide an update at the April okay. 17th meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anything under miscellaneous? Council Moreau. I just wanted to give a quick update on the task that they had given Land Use Committee to look at city owned properties. Uh, we met on the 10th of March, which was about 10 days ago. Um, and we had brought forward the 195 properties we had originally looked at, narrowed it down to um, no, probably about 15 to 20, which then we narrowed down to seven, and then we added two back in based off of the recommendations that we got that day. And now we have tasked staff with doing some more boots on the ground investigation into some of those final properties uh, to, before the report will then go back to land use and then hopefully, um, depending on where the report sits there, whether when it comes back to city council. I just wanted to give that sort of update on the process of where we're at. Thank you, Councilor Moreau. Councilor Boyla. Thank you. Um, and I'll just touch on Councilor Moreau's. Um, we had a wonderful three-hour meeting, um, but it, it is online. The second half of it does really a good job of explaining why affordable housing is needed in Portsmouth. Uh, it shows all the housing dynamics. It really breaks it down. Um, Nick Recknell did a great job on the presentation. Um, but I really encourage anyone that's concerned about this topic to, to watch to watch this video. Um, it's from the last land use committee meeting, um, and it's really the second half of the meeting. Um, yeah, the first hour was um, about those properties. The second two hours was presentations yeah. and some really 
good information um, that was. But yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you know all the council to watch it as well. There was just a lot of very useful information, um, a lot of you know points, a lot, a lot of questions answered. Yep. Thank you. And thanks to the land use committee. Um, all right. Any other miscellaneous items? I will await a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, Portsmouth.